Okay, welcome to today's uh, visit training session titled An Overview of Tropical Cyclone Track Guidance Models Used by NHC. And we're pleased to have a Mike Brennan from NHC uh, leading this presentation for today. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mike. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, I'm not sure how many folks we have on the, on the line for the training, but uh, you know, this is certainly meant to to be informal and have some back and forth. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to jump in. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, all those uh, folks listed on the slide here from NHC and Sierra and elsewhere who helped put this training together over the years. It's sort of evolved with time and, and as we've made progress and uh, changes to the models. So um, the general objectives of the training today are, are basically so that by the end of the, the session, you'll be able to describe the different types of TC track models, the, the entire spectrum that we use here at NHC, uh, understand the strengths and weaknesses of each type of model, and how the track models are used in consensus forecasts, which is one of the primary tools we use for forecasting track here. And uh, it'll also uh, give you an overview of uh, basically changes, recent and future planned changes to the uh, forecast models. So uh, the outline today, we'll first talk a little bit about the basics of tropical cyclone motion, and then we'll go through an overview of the different types of track model guidance. We'll talk about the data that's incorporated into the dynamical models to analyze the atmosphere and uh, basically provide an initial state for those models. We'll talk about the concept of late versus early models uh, that we use for, for TC track forecasting. Then we'll go into how the uh, ensembles are created and talk about the consensus models that we use. And finally, we'll wrap up with some track model verification from uh, 2015. So first of all, you know, why do tropical cyclones move? Uh, you know, there's many factors here that are controlling the motion of, if, for example, in this animation that you see. You see uh, there's a, a certainly a general sort of steady west-northwestward heading but there's also some small-scale oscillations and wobbles of the center and the eye uh, that, are, that are occurring on much shorter time scales. So there's multiple factors that play into to tropical cyclone motion. The primary one is sort of the, is the steering by the deep layer mean environmental wind, and that really is the, the primary factor uh, that controls, I would say, three-quarters to 80 percent, maybe even a little more of the, of the, uh, of the motion of the TC. There's also the northwestward drift in the northern hemisphere due to the interaction with the gradient of the Coriolis parameter, which is also called the beta effect, and that actually uh, scales with the storm size. Uh, there are interactions with other environmental PV gradients. There's a tendency to drift towards and to the left of the PV gradient uh, in the northern hemisphere. There can be interaction with land, uh, especially mountainous terrain like Hispaniola or Hawaii or Taiwan that can uh, sort of deflect uh, tropical cyclone track. Uh, and then there's also small scale oscillations due to inner core convective asymmetries like you saw in that animation. You saw the center sort of jump around as the eye began to form and as the convection in the core evolved. And those are typically occurring on a shorter time scale. But the important thing to remember is that if the first thing on this list is weak, if the steering by the deep layer mean environmental wind is, is small, they're basically very weak, large-scale steering flow, all of these other parameters take on increased importance and actually can make track forecasting much more difficult when the environmental flow is very weak because then you're more dependent on these sort of small-scale oscillations and convective asymmetries that are much more difficult to predict. So here's a hierarchy of uh, tropical cyclone track model guidance that's been used over the years. Uh, for forecasting here at NHC. We'll start off with sort of the simplest types of models, which would be statistical models. And those are basically forecasts that are made by using observed relationships with uh, storm-specific information. So, for example, a climatology and persistence model that basically looks at what storms in a pr in, at, that have previously been at this position, at this location, at this time of year, at this intensity, what have they done in the past? So uh, essentially uh, tying past behavior to, to the current storm and, and trying to make a prediction of what's going to happen. And there can also be a, 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 a persistence element to this as well. Now, Clipper is really only used for a statistical baseline to compare all of our track model forecast against at this point. It's not, certainly not used uh, as an as a actual model for forecasting. We also have statistical dynamical track models where we used to. We don't really have them anymore. 
Um, there were statistical models that used input from dynamical model output. So you would say you would run a statistical model that would use, say, output from the GFS model uh, as predictors and then try to predict what the tropical cyclone would do in terms of track. And these had really had their heyday about 30 years ago. Uh, they were overtaken in the 1990s, and we actually got rid of the last statistical dynamical track model about 10 years ago. Uh, we also have simplified dynamical models like the L-bar, which is a barotropic model, very simple using vertically layer averaged winds from uh, the GFS model plus a, a representation of the TC vortex. And then we also have the, these tab models, which are actually new this year, replacing the beta advection models. But they're trajectory models that basically put a tropical cyclone into the large scale atmosphere and predict how it's going to move. It does account for, it uses a very smooth representation of the uh, uh, large-scale flow, and it also accounts for things like the beta effect. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about the tab models. They, as I mentioned, they, they use the uh, prevailing flow from the GFS forecast and, uh, and are computed over different layers of the atmosphere, depending on how, how deep the tropical cyclone vortex is. And then we have the dynamical models, which are basically the everyday models we use for, for weather forecasting, like the global models like the GFS and the UK Met, the ECMWF. And then we also have regional hurricane models like the H4, the GFDL, the COAMPS TC that are run specifically for tropical cyclones. But these models are, you know, starting with an initial state and, and then solving all the physical equations of the atmosphere to try and, and predict all the parameters in the atmosphere, temperature, wind, humidity, uh, uh, mass and basically tropical cyclone track forecasts come out of those. And then we finally we have ensemble and consensus forecasts, which are different ways to combine uh, model output. So again, we'll go back to, to talk a little bit more about these in detail. Uh, going back to Clipper was originally developed in the early 1970s. Uh, it runs out to five days, and, and actually there's a new version, a trajectory clipper that runs out to seven days that uh, Mark Maria developed a couple of years ago. But it, it's really very simple. It uses just the current and 12-hour old speed and direction of motion of the storm, the current latitude and longitude, the day of the year, and the intensity. And so from those, uh, I guess would be one, two, three, four, five, six, or six parameters or so, it can actually predict a tropical cyclone track based on previous behavior. And uh, again, this is just simply used as a benchmark. Uh, if you have a forecast that have errors larger than Clipper, you're essentially going to have no skill. And when you see some of the verification results later on in the presentation, they will actually be skill diagrams relative to the performance of Clipper. So you'll see that later on. Uh, but this image down here at the bottom basically just shows you the average Clipper model errors in the Atlantic and the East Pacific over the last uh, five years from 2011 to 2015. Um, does anybody want to take a, a, a venture to guess as why the average clipper errors are larger in the Atlantic Basin than in the East Pacific? Does that have to do with the storms curving more in the Atlantic? Yeah, basically, yeah. The, the East Pacific is a much simpler basin for track forecasting. Most of the storms uh, move at a very climatological uh, heading, like 285 and 11 knots south of the ridge. Uh, so on average, the East Pacific cyclone track is much easier to forecast in the Atlantic. There's much more influence from the mid-latitudes in the Atlantic Basin, sort of a lot of, a lot more different possibilities in terms of track and, and the influences that you can have in that basin relative to the Pacific. So, yeah, that's right. Here are the uh, simplified dynamical tab models here on slide 8. Um, they were designed to replace the old beta advection models in 2016, and, and we're actually the beta, the BAMs are still running now. We actually just did a comparison this morning to see how the verification is going between the two, and, and the tab models are, are much better in terms of forecasting track, uh, small, much smaller errors than the beta advection models had in the past. But they're basically trajectory models, so they use a very smooth horizontal wind field from the GFS in sort of a circular average around the storm, and it also includes the beta drift uh, to try to minimize the forecast errors. And the thing to know about the tab models is there are sort of three versions. There's a shallow tab that uses the steering flow over a 850 to 700 millibar layer, a medium tab that uses 850 to 400, and then a deep layer tab that would use basically a tropospheric deep steering layer from 850 to 200 millibars. And 
you would use the, the different tabs based on how vertically deep the tropical cyclone vortex is. You know, the shallow uh, tab would be most appropriate for weak systems, tropical depressions, uh, decaying systems uh, that are becoming remnant lows that have all the convection sheared off. Uh, and then medium tab, the medium layer uh, steering average for up to about 400 millibars would probably be more appropriate for tropical storm up to uh, sort of a, a, the, uh, right to the hurricane threshold. And then most hurricanes and certainly major hurricanes are going to be deep uh, tropospheric vortices and the, the deep layer tab model would be the most appropriate one to use. And I should mention here on the, uh, uh, going back to slide eight, what do you think that Anybody have an answer to this question? What does a large spread between the tab models indicate about the atmospheric environment around the storm? That lots of shear. Exactly. Yeah. So in this particular case, you can see that the the deep layer tab model has a much farther north and farther east track, so that the there's a lot more. Yeah. So there is a, a vertical wind shear in this particular case. If there's very little to no shear the tab models will all be basically right on top of each other. So here's an outline of the primary dynamical models that we're using here at, at NHC for forecasting track. Um, the global models that I mentioned, obviously we're using the GFS, uh, the ECMWF and the Met Office uh, global model. Uh, and then we also use three main regional models, the GFDL, uh, which is a regional hurricane model run by the, or developed by the, the GFDL lab in New Jersey. It's been around for about 20 years or so. Uh, we also use the COAMPS TC, which is the U.S. Navy's mesoscale TC model, and the HWARF, which has uh, been around now for about about 10 years or so, uh, the, the new NSEP, uh, basically, regional hurricane model. So those are the, the six main dynamical models that we use for track, and we'll talk a little bit more about them going forward. Um, one thing I do want to mention, is in the hurricane models in particular in the past have used uh, – vortex bogusing as a tool to, to try and create an, a, a realistic looking initial tropical cyclone vortex. And, and this used to be used even more in the global models as well. Uh, the GFS will actually still use bogusing, but only if the vortex can't be found in the initial state. Uh, it, it, otherwise, it basically just relocates the first guess vortex to our, our analyzed position at the synoptic time. Uh, but none of the other global models do bogusing in terms of uh, at least the main ones that we use, the Met Office and the ECMWF. But bogusing was really designed mainly for a, a previous era where global models were run at quite coarse resolution, and they couldn't really hope to properly initialize or analyze a tropical cyclone vortex. And so basically the way bogus, bogusing worked is that you basically put synthetic data into the model analyses uh, wind profiles, other other pieces of information to try and capture the the TC vortex structure, at least some or at least some crude representation of it. Uh, the downside of this is it can significantly alter the surrounding environment in the atmos atmosphere. It can affect things like vertical wind shear, and we found that over time that that the forecasts for TC track and structure and intensity can be very sensitive to small changes in the bogusing. And into the uh, and in the near storm environment because you're not just affecting the tropical cyclone vortex with the bogus data, you're affecting the environment around the storm. And we found that over time that these bogus vortices tend to be too resilient during extratropical transition. They tend to retain warm core structure too long, which can affect our our intensity and structural forecast. And that's why most centers have have generally moved away from from bogusing. Um, here's just an example of the impact that the bogusing can have on the, the calculation of vertical wind shear. So what you're looking at here is a, uh, a time series. Uh, and on the uh, y-axis on the left side is the uh, 850 to 200 millibar deep layer shear. And in the, the uh, blue bars show the shear calculation from the GFS, the red bars show it from the GFDL, and the yellow bars show it from the HWARF. And as you go through from forecast cycle to forecast cycle along the x-axis, you can see that for the same initial time, say here at 12Z on August 20th, you can see that the uh, GFS and GFDL models analyzed shear of around 20 knots, where the h wharf was only around 14. And some of these differences could be due to those differences in the bogus, uh, the use of a bogus vortex between these various models. Here again, here's another time at 18Z on the 22nd of August, where you can see that 
the GFS and GFDL had less than five knots of shear, but the H wharf had over 15 knots. So you can see how those differences in the in the environment could uh, play a large role in in, in 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 differences that would develop between these various models and their depiction of the structure and intensity of the cyclone. And not to say that any one of them is right or wrong. It's just to show you that that variability can exist due to uh, to changes in the initial vortex and in your storm environment. So let's talk a little bit about horizontal resolution for, for the global spectral models. Uh, just a reminder that, you know, the spectral models are really run with, uh, they're basically four-year uh, uh, series of Lagrande functions in latitude, four-year series in longitude. And most of the global spectral models now use a triangular truncation. So you'll see a, a T number thrown around, like T400, for example. And the latitude and longitude series contain the same number of terms, and so you end up with a Basically, with a spectral model, you have uniform spatial resolution over a sphere, which you wouldn't necessarily have at, on, a, on a grid point model. But a rough estimate of, uh, of finding what the, the uh, comparative, comparable grid point resolution would be is you just take uh, 40,000 and divide it by three times the truncation number. So, for example, if you have a T400 model, uh, you would just take 40,000 and divide it by three times 400, and that would give you a, a rough uh, estimate of a grid, grid resolution of about 33 kilometers for a model such as that. And here are the actual global model properties for the main global models that we use here at NHC, in addition to a couple of other ones that we, we use a little less often. But uh, you can see here in the, uh, in the uh, third column is the horizontal grid spacing or its equivalent for a spectral model. You can see it, uh, the main global models now range in, in equivalent horizontal resolution from the ECMWF, which runs at about 9 kilometers. The GFS is about 13 uh, through 10 days. It degrades down to 35 kilometers after that. The UK MET is actually a grid point model. It runs at 17 kilometer grid resolution in the mid latitudes. The NAVGEM is about 37 kilometers, and the Canadian model, which is also a grid point, their, their global model is about 25 kilometers up at the higher mid-latitudes near 50 north. You can see there's also a variety of uh, vertical resolutions ranging from 50 levels, uh, vertical levels in the NAV gym up to 137 in the ECMWF. The differences in pressure coordinates and physics and data simulation, although all of the models now are using some type of, of 40 VAR, many are using some type of ensemble hybrid uh, Kalman filter approach. And again, just to emphasize the the only global models that use any kind of bogusing now for TCs are the NAVGEM, uh, which is done all the time, and then the GFS, but it's only done very rarely if the vortex, the initial vortex can't be found for relocation. I think it's probably less than 5% of the time in the GFS model. So, but this slide is mainly there as a reference point uh, for you to come back to if you need to. So now let's move on to the regional hurricane models. Uh, we'll first talk about the GFDL model, which, as I mentioned, has been around for uh, more than 20 years. It's, it's a, a dyna fully dynamical model. It's also coupled with an ocean model. And it uh, does a basically takes the GFS initial vortex and spins another vortex up in a model, a different model, and sort of merges it back in with the GFS background state. Um, it's run with a, a, on a limited area domain. It has sort of tri a triple nest configuration with an outer grid at about 55 kilometer resolution, a middle grid at 18 kilometers, and an inner grid at six. And this is what that sort of uh, nested grid configuration looks like. And the middle and fine mesh grids are, follow the tropical cyclone itself, so they move along with the storm during the model integration. Um, some changes to the GFDL model for 2016 include some changes to the uh, detrainment parameter and the microphysics and the convective scheme, uh, changing the convective time scale and how often the, the convection is called, uh, new functionality to ingest the GFS grid data to create the lateral boundary conditions, and trying to improve the representation of the initial wind profile for the tropical cyclone. And there were some changes to the ocean initialization to run off the RTOFs ocean analysis now in the East Pacific, and there are a variety of other sort of small changes to scripting, post-processing, bug fixes, and, and some of the uh, product output. Then we also have the HWARF model, which is NCEP's uh, non-hydrostatic uh, prediction uh, hurricane forecast model. It also has a three-way nested grid, uh, 61 vertical levels, and an outer grid. It runs at about 18-kilometer resolution, or grid resolution, a middle grid at six, 
and an inner grid at two kilometers. And this model is coupled with the Princeton Ocean model in both the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific. And it's, uh, the vortex is initialized through the use of a modified first guess from the previous six-hour H4 forecast. But it also does data assimilation, uh, particularly in the hurricane core. It can actually real, in real time assimilate tail Doppler radar from the NOAA P3 and use uh, Doppler radar, uh, land-based Doppler radar data. And it's been under development now for about 15 years, became operational in 2007, and, and, and continues to basically run in parallel with the GFDL. So we have two mesoscale hurricane models. But here's just an example of how the grid system works. Up here in the upper left, you see a representation of how the, uh, the middle and inner grids move with the storm within the outer uh, larger domain. We uh, have the ability to look at fields like simulated radar reflectivity and also the uh, you know, cloud liquid water and the various hydrometeor components to look at the structure of the storm. We have the ability to look at things like simulated satellite imagery, simulated microwave uh, imagery for looking at storm structure in the forecast. The uh, 2016 big changes for the H wharf included uh, making the nested domain sizes bigger. Uh, the uh, middle domain now is 25 by 25 degrees, and that inner two kilometer nest is eight, uh, more than eight degrees square now. Uh, some changes to the actual dynamics of the model, uh, improving the data assimilation. Uh, it's assimilating more satellite observations now, and the data assimilation has been turned on for storms in the East Pacific. Uh, some changes to the ocean and wave coupling, and uh, basically coupling the winds from the H wharf to the hurricane wave model for both uh, the North Atlantic and East Pacific storms. Again, some changes similar to the GFDL, some changes to the uh, simplified Arakawa Schubert convective scheme, and some of the uh, exchange coefficients in the boundary layer. And there's a uh, this year there's a capacity to run up to eight storms uh, at one time in the uh, H wharf. Uh, that's new this year. And here's just on slide 21, sort of a comparison of the uh, uh, physical parameterizations between the two models. And they've sort of diverged over the years. They used to be pretty similar. Some of the uh, some of the, the physics have, have are still the same, but others have changed, especially as the H wharf has evolved quite a bit over the last few years. So you really got a nice uh, diversity of, of both model setup and uh, physics between the two. So moving on now, you know, looking at slide 22, this is just a representation, say, from the GFS of the analyzed 500 millibar wind field around Hurricane Irene back in August of 2011. Uh, that's what the blue barbs are showing. The yellow barbs are showing you the locations of the rayobs uh, at uh, 12Z on uh, August 21st that day. So you can see where the in situ data from the uh, rayob network are playing a role in the, in the analysis from the model. But where does all the other data for the wind structure, say the 500 millibar wind field, where is that coming from away from land and away from radio on? Satellite. Right. Basically, satellite is providing most of the observations, uh, certainly in terms of number, if not in terms of influence. Uh, millions of satellite observations going into INCEPT's uh, data assimilation system now, both from polar orbiting satellites and sensors like AMSU and microwave sounders uh, to uh, cloud track winds from the geostationary satellites. Uh, there's also data from radar. There's uh, radiances from uh, the geostationary sounders. So there's a tremendous amount of satellite data that are going into just the background analysis of the atmosphere and the initial state of all the model guidance, and not just for tropical cyclones, but for everything else. We also use satellite data indirectly through our, our estimates of the tropical cyclone position and pressure uh, do play a role in the initial uh, spin up of the hurricane models and also the vortex relocation that can occur in the GFS. And the central pressure that we provide in our analysis of the storm each cycle is also treated as an observation in the GFS that gets assimilated just like another data point. So the satellite data that we're looking at as forecasters and the analyses that come from that through things like the Dvorak technique are, are also being used to uh, indirectly re, uh, initialize uh, the model guidance. In addition to the satellite data, we have the ability to deploy aircraft to, to do targeted observations. 
We have the NOAA Gulfstream jet that flies these synoptic surveillance missions into tropical cyclones, typically ones that are threatening the United States. And these missions will release 20 to 30 GPS drops in, in the near storm environment. Mainly, the, these missions were originally designed to help improve the analysis of the steering flow. So you're getting basically the drops on profiles of wind, temperature, and moisture from the altitude of the jet up near 200 millibars all the way down to the surface. And over time, you know, on average, these data have been shown in the GFS to help decrease the track forecast error by up to 25% in the first couple of days of the forecast. But more recent work has shown that, that as the data simulation systems have become more sophisticated, uh, these data can also affect the structure and intensity of the cyclone itself. Uh, we did a study on Tropical Storm Karen in the Gulf of Mexico a few years ago and found that the G4 drops on data helped uh, basically better capture the shear and the dry air in the environment around the storm and led to a better forecast of, of the storm weakening uh, as opposed to if, if that data hadn't been available. And we can also supplement the G4 data with flights from the Air Force and NOAA P3 if needed. And then slide 25 just shows you a typical pattern of the drops-ons uh, from the aircraft here around Hurricane Irene. There's a, a flight, the flight pattern will fly a circle around the storm itself and then Based on the uncertainty that we see in the model guidance, we draw a flight track that tries to sample areas where we think it added initial data will help. Oftentimes for recurving systems in the Atlantic, this can be, uh, you know, how strong is the western edge or western extent of the subtropical ridge. You can see that there's uh, several uh, sort of zigzag pattern of drop-ons here between Florida and north of the Bahamas that are trying to capture that, uh, that uh, detail on the western side of the ridge. And, and you also plotted on here the uh, coverage from the 12 uh, zero Z radio songs for that cycle so that uh, we try to uh, basically optimize the coverage of data taking into account the radio songs that are there and sort of try to fill in the gaps with the G4. So let's move on to the late versus early model concept. Um, in our terminology, late models are models that are not available at the synoptic time. So for example, when we're sitting down to do the 12 Z cycle forecast for a tropical cyclone that, that comes out at 15Z, a late model would be any of the dynamical models that are run at 12Z that day, because they're not going to be available until after our forecast is out. So we don't have the 12Z GFS to look at when we do the 12Z forecast package for a storm. So what we typically do is we use the previous cycle's uh, dynamical model guidance, say the GFDL or the GFS, and we interpolate those results to the latest NHC position. So where we think the storm is at 12Z, we'll take the six or 12 hour forecast from the previous model cycle and move that to our initial position so that all the guidance starts at, the, at our uh, analyzed position of the storm. And basically that, uh, that interpolation is applied through the whole track of the uh, vortex through that model's forecast. And all the late models would include all the dynamical models, so all the global models and then all the regional hurricane models. Now, uh, our parlance would be the early models uh, would be models that are available right at the synoptic time. So these very simple models like the L-bar or the tabs or clipper, and then also the interpolated dynamical models from the previous cycle. Those are the models that we actually have available to make the forecast for that given cycle. So now we'll move on to ensemble forecasts. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about just sort of ensembles in general. You know, in terms of the classical way that an ensemble is constructed, they're basically, you're running a single model over and over again with slightly perturbed initial conditions. And you're trying to, to make those initial condition changes represent how much uncertainty there is in the initial analysis and, and capture that error distribution. And so each forecast in the ensemble is known as a member. So you may have a 20-member ensemble or 50-member ensemble. And you hope that if your ensemble is, is constructed co correctly and really capturing the uncertainty, that when you see large spread, that implies low confidence in a particular feature. And small spread would hopefully imply high confidence in a feature like the location of a, a trough axis or a ridge or a tropical cyclone. So uh, this, this chart is just showing spaghetti plots of a uh, of, of 540 decameter or 500 millibar height contour and the 582 contour from a couple of different ensemble systems just to give you an idea of what that can look like. Um, here's what it looks like in terms of a, a tropical cyclone track. This is from Hurricane Joaquin in 2015. These are the GEFS ensemble members. Each line is one of the different perturbations in the GEFS ensemble. 
you can see a tremendous amount of spread in this particular case. You have some ensemble members taking Joaquin uh, out of the Bahamas to the northeast, uh, passing west of Bermuda and then on out to the North Atlantic. You have another uh, almost half of the ensemble members showing a north northwestward or northward track, and then a sharp westward uh, recurvature back towards the uh, uh, southeastern and mid-Atlantic coast of the United States. So. Again, this was a situation when there was a lot of uncertainty in Joaquin's track, and the ensemble did actually capture that uncertainty. The, the actual uh, truth sort of lay on the, the sort of the right side of the ensemble guidance uh, envelope here, but it was, was within the envelope. The other methodology we use for, for tropical cyclone track forecasting in particular is a sort of multi-model ensemble. And these are forecasts from different models at the same initial time. So for GC track, we found that the multi-model ensemble is usually superior to a single model ensemble because for a couple of reasons. First, when you're using different models, they have different biases and random errors that can often cancel or offset each other. And two, because our, our multi-model ensemble is typically uh, created using the deterministic model, say like the GFS or the ECMWF, you have the benefit of that, of that particular model's very high resolution relative to a single model ensemble that's typically run at lower resolution. And we use these multi-model ensembles to create what we call consensus forecasts. And you'll see us talk about the consensus aids a lot in our tropical cyclone discussions. And the consensus models that we use, we sort of have three different types. There's a fixed consensus where you have to have all the members present for the consensus to be computed. And then you just take a linear average of the members. There's a variable consensus where you can have some members missing, as long, say, as long as you have two or three of the members, the, the consensus will be created, and that'll be a linear average. And then we have other things like a corrected consensus, say like the Florida State Super Ensemble, that is trying to bias correct or weight the different members in the consensus differently based on how well they're, they've performed in the past in certain situations or how well they're expected to perform in this type of forecast situation. And here's the definitions of the consensus models that we're using for this year. Uh, we have the GFEX, which is a consensus of the GFS and European. And here's our, our sort of multi-model consensus aids. The main one, ones we use are the TVCA and TVCE, and they're both actually the same. We have the ability to create different consensus aids for the different basins in case we decide we want to include or exclude a model in one basin or the other. But right now, the, the main consensus aid has a, is a five, or actually has six members, the GFS, the UK Met, the GFDL, the HWARF, the European, and then we added in the Navy's COAMPS TC model this year to both the track and intensity consensus aids for both basins. So, uh, so these are the main uh, models that we uh, use for sort of our first guess at the, the best track forecast each cycle is generally going to be the consensus aid. And here's an example of how the consensus can be uh, helpful. This is uh, from Tropical Storm Cristobal back in 2014. The storm was uh, up here north of the uh, northeast of the Bahamas. It was forecast over the next five days. Each of these lines is one model forecast. It's forecast to generally move northward or northeastward and then recurve out into the Atlantic. But if you look at the five-day forecast from, or four-day forecast from each of these models, you can see that the, you know, the GFDL and GFS are faster and farther to the right. The European is to the left. The H works a little slower. The UK Met's a lot slower. If you average those together, you get the consensus forecast here in the orange, which is the TVCA. And in this case, the actual verifying position was almost right on top of the uh, uh, consensus forecast. So the consensus was better than any of the individual member forecast that went into it. And that's basically how the consensus is designed to work. Uh, it performs best when all of the member models are in general agreement on the overall scenario, but there are these sort of minor detail or small scale differences between them that can almost be considered like noise or random error that can be canceled out by having a multi-model consensus. So let's talk a little bit now about verification. Uh, we basically, for computing track verification, we're just calculating how far away the forecast is in terms of distance from our analyzed best track position after the storm at that valid time. When we do the verification, we require a homogeneous sample. So it's a you're basically saying that all the models you're including were all available for all the cases for you to include in this particular evaluation. 
Um, our official verification only includes the tropical and subtropical stages. We don't officially include the uh, extra tropical stage or post tropical stage after a system loses tropical characteristics. And as I mentioned earlier, we're, what I'm going to show you are skill diagrams relative to Clipper. So skill is going to be positive if your errors are smaller than that from the Clipper model. Uh, so obviously uh, up is going to be good on these particular diagrams that we're going to look at. Uh, well, actually, the, the diagram on the left here is actually just track error. The one on the right is skill. But this is mean absolute error on the left uh, over the last five years in the Atlantic Basin. And you can see the official forecast has much lower error here in the black relative to the simple models. These are the BAMs, uh, the LBAR, and then climatology and persistence. So you can see that obviously the official forecast, which has the ability to look at a lot more sophisticated model output than the BAMs or the LBAR, is, is showing a lot more, a lot lower track forecast error and then a lot of skill a lot more skill relative to climatology and persistence, 60 to 70 percent skill, uh, versus the simple models are really a sort of down here in this sort of 20 to 40 percent skill range uh, in the Atlantic Basin. Now, it's important to realize that the, the best performing track models can really vary from year to year. Um, the models are always undergoing upgrades, so uh, from one season to the next, you can't assume that whatever model was best in the previous year would be best this year. Uh, and then the character of the seasons is different. Some seasons you have more storms in the deep tropics, uh, which one model may do better at. Other seasons you may have more storms that are coming out of mid the middle latitudes, which uh, uh, a different model might have a better handle on in terms of track. But what you can see here is that the, the color coding here shows you what type of model has been the best model for the track in the Atlantic at 48 hours here in this column and 96 hours in the right column going for 48 hours all the way back to the late 1980s. And you can see back then the statistical dynamical models were the best. Uh, then the simplified dynamical models had a, a, a brief heyday here in the early 1990s. After that time, the GFDL model was uh, best in the mid-90s. And then the, the reign of the global model guidance really began with the UK Met, the GFS, one year the no gaps was best. Then the GFDL had a, had a run here in the early 2000s where it was the best track model at 48 hours. And then the global models sort of had another string from 2006 with the GFS. Then the European was, uh, was quite good in that stretch in terms of being the best model. And then the HWARF was best in 2014, and the European was best again in 2015. Um, now, if you look at 96 hours out of day four, generally the global models have been superior here especially the European uh, since the uh, early 2010 time frame. Uh, but there's been some, again, run-to-run -run or year-to-year -year variability. The HWARF was actually best at 2013 at four days, the UK met at 2014, and the ECMWF in 2015. But just remember that there's a lot of year-to-year uh, -year variability in the performance of the models, and, and that can even come down to storm-to-storm -to -storm variability. The model that is best for one particular storm might not be the best for the next storm. And here's the more complete uh, track model verification for 2015. Again, this is a skill diagram relative to Clipper, so up is good on the y-axis. And this is out to five days, so there's a, there's a column for each of our official forecast times from 12 hours here on the left up to 120 hours on the right. Uh, the thing that jumps out at you for 2015 in the Atlantic was that the European was better than any other piece of guidance. Uh, generally from 36 hours beyond, um, better than the consensus, better than the official forecast, and certainly better than any one, any other individual model. Uh, that's a very impressive result showing that the, the European is able to beat the consensus consistently, uh, especially by this much at these sort of longer time ranges. Now, 2015 wasn't the largest sample. We only have 36 verifying forecasts at 120 hours. So, uh, But you do see some trends here that the official forecast was very close in the black line to the consensus aids, the, uh, the multi-model consensus and the Florida State Super Ensemble out through about three days. We actually beat the consensus aids at uh, days four and five. The dark blue line was the GFS. It was up here a little less skillful than the consensus. The GFS Ensemble mean in light blue uh, trailed that. The UK Met was sort of uh, right with the GFS Ensemble mean out through day four and tailed off at day five. And then we sort of have this second tier of model guidance here with the HWARF, the GFDL, the Canadian, the GFDN, uh, 
and the nav gym sort of trailing that pack. So you can sort of see there's sort you sort of see from year to year there'll be sort of different tiers of model performers. The European was clearly best last year. Then the consensus aids and sort of the GFS and UK Met GFS ensemble mean, and then the other dynamical models uh, sort of trailed behind there. Um, if you look at the East Pacific, it's a little bit of a different story in that basin. The consensus is very very difficult to beat in that basin for any one individual model, and you can see that here in 2015 the consensus was basically the best performing at all times, except the uh, official forecast actually eked out a little bit over the consensus at day five. The individual models, the, the European, the UK Met, and the GFS were all sort of here in a in tightly clustered just behind the consensus aids. The HWARF was up there as well. The GFDL lagged a little bit, and the Canadian and the NAVGEM were, were well behind the rest of the guidance in that basin uh, last year. Uh, one thing that's important to understand is that there can be serial correlation of track forecast model errors. And that basically means that the biases and the errors of the track models tend to be correlated over a few forecast cycles for the same storm. So in this example from Hurricane Dean in 2007, you can see that at 18Z on the 17th of August, the GFDL was off to the right. The uh, GFS was, was uh, farther down to the left. And that uh, was consistent over several forecast cycles. You still see that trend uh, 12 hours later, the GFDL to the right, the GFS to the left, the HWARF sort of down the middle. And uh, that can be a, a helpful tool for the forecaster if you see, sort of see those trends develop. But, you know, when we're making the official track forecast, our, our first guess is usually the multi-model consensus if we think that uh, if, if we think that that's reliable and that the, most of the model guidance is, again, on this sort of general big picture scenario, same page, the, the consensus is going to be your best way to try to minimize error. But if there are big shifts in the track model guidance from one cycle to the next, we're typically going to be con very conservative and try to maintain continuity and not make big changes from one cycle to the next following the, the, the first big shift we see in the model guidance because we don't want to have to make a, a big change and then come back six or 12 hours later if there's another big shift in the guidance later on. So we'll typically make incremental changes toward the new multi-model consensus uh, most of the time. So here's a trend uh, showing the track model error for the official forecast in the Atlantic Basin uh, going back over the last 25 years, starting in 1990, going through 20, 2015. So what do you think have been the, the driving uh, uh, what, what's been driving this decrease in track model error in the Atlantic Basin over this past 25 years or so? The increasing uh, reliability and verification of the dynamical models. Yeah, it's basically the dynamical model improved. Uh, the human gets some credit for developing tools like the consensus aids and recognizing that those uh, have some uh, ability to try to further minimize error as well, but we are still making progress, even at uh, 24 hours, where the, the you know our average error now is down below 50 miles. Uh, we've seen some very sharp decreases in average error in the last few years. Here at 24, at 48 and 72 hour, our average 72 hour error now is below 100 nautical miles. So some very sharp downward trends as the skill of the models has improved. Uh, the resolution is better. There's more data going into the models from satellite and more sophisticated data assimilation schemes that have improved how that data is being used. And we see a similar trend in the Pacific as well. Uh, the error reduction since 1990 out there has been about 35 to 60 percent. Uh, uh, again, very sharp increases, especially at the longer time ranges during the past few years. Um, so just to wrap, start wrapping up, there are other forecast parameters in our products beyond track. Obviously, we're forecasting intensity, genesis out to five days. We're trying to forecast probabilistically uh, where tropical cyclogenesis will occur. We have forecast of uh, tropical cyclone size, how big are the 30, 54, and 64 knot winds, storm surge information provided within in the sort of hurricane watch warning time frame uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Rainfall predictions provided mainly by WPC, uh, tornado information, and our public advisories comes from SPC in coordination with the WFOs. And then for marine interest, we have the 
12 foot seas radius of avoidance area that comes from our, our marine branch, TAP B, and, and also from the Ocean Prediction Center farther north. So, just to wrap things up for, for the track model guidance, you know, the dynamical models are generally outperforming the simpler techniques, and that's been the case for quite some time. Uh, no single model is always going to be best for forecasting TC track. We've already seen you know, because the models change every year, we go into a new season, we don't don't really have a good feel for the models sometimes. Uh, the East Pacific, for example, this season, the ECMWF is amongst one of the worst individual models for forecasting track, which is we found surprising. We've got a lot of cases out there, and it's trailing the GFS and some of the other dynamical my, guidance by quite a lot. Um, that's why we tend to rely on the consensus forecast, so you don't tie yourself to one individual model. And remember that if there is this year-to-year, storm-to-storm, or even cycle-to-cycle -cycle variability in the quality of the model guidance. And uh, you know, we're hopeful that the global models will continue to improve along with HWARF and the other regional models going forward and, and really get at this uh, issue of, of vortex initialization and getting the structure of the storm right. I think some of our biggest track forecast challenges right now come in situations where there's uncertainty in the storm structure and what the dominant steering layer is going to be for a system. And, the, and then that falls back to being able to properly forecast structure and intensity. When your track forecast is dependent on you being able to forecast the intensity correctly, you're going to have a lot more uncertainty. Uh, so that, that's one of our biggest challenges right now. So uh, let's see. Just uh, one last slide on slide 42 has a lot of links to various model explanations and pages and descriptions that, that you can use as a reference. So. I'll be glad to, to take any questions you might have. Otherwise, uh, I think that wraps things up.